You know, John, one of the commitments that I made when I started doing this show was to bring in individuals who have a great outlook on life, caregiving, relationships, family, and a lot of humor. And I reached uh, into your vault, John, and brought out one of your childhood heroes who shaped you as a young John Butler. (laughs) Uh, You're one of his biggest fans, and uh, this is Jim Brewer. People know him from all over the country and and the world, uh, from Saturday Night Live, Home Improvement. He's just tons of comedy stuff. But you know what? Everybody is affected by this issue of being a caregiver, and Jim's no exception, except he did it a little bit different. So, Jim, welcome to the show and I'm so glad you're here with us. Uh, it's great to be here. I love this topic. You embraced something different. Uh, you took care of your father for a long time. Your relationship with your dad was so fabulous. And it's been talked about a lot. But I want you to share it with our audience on what happened. Because not only did you serve as a caregiver for him in, in his later time, but you guys formed an act together. He, he was always really funny growing up. And um, but he was a completely different style of humor than mine. He came from a, a dark world. He came from that World War II era. He had he had ten brothers and sisters. His mom died by the time he was three. Um, and then by the time he was high school, he's off in World War II for three four years. And then and then uh, you know, so his his life wasn't pretty. And the more I in, The more I learned about that and realized that man never complained a day in his life, um, I I think he's one of the greatest humans I ever came across. And he always found the funny, and he's always black and white with with the most harshest things. I'm like, Dad, you're not going to believe what happened. He goes, well, you know, I guess that sucks. (laughs) Thanks, Dad. You don't understand. He goes, no, I do. It sucks. <laughs> what else do you want to say? And no matter what happened, if it was death, if it was the worst breakup, I just saw someone got hit by a car, uh, I, I lost, I lost, it doesn't matter. Well, that sucked. <laughs> just, and I'm like, that's all you have? And you know what? He sums it up. I, I mean... You know, my sister passed away two years ago. When he passed away, it was just like, so, you know, what are you going to say? It sucks. Okay, now what? It's just, move on. It sucks. That's Tell me, it. when you decided to go into comedy, now given his background, yeah. I mean, that's that, that greatest generation, that's a different world, and you're going into comedy. How did that conversation go? You know what? I came to him. I came to both of my parents. It was 1989. I already wanted to go into comedy. I already dabbled in it. I already dabbled in acting. I loved acting. And then they moved to Florida, and I kind of lost direction. And I finally said, you know what? This is, this is not my destination. My destination is not to fall back and have an education. It just, it's not me. And when I finally made that decision, and I went there, my mom had a heart attack, but my father was the one who said, you listen to me, you're young, and you go after your dream. I never had that chance. The last thing you want in life is to be your late 20s and 30s and to resent that you never went after your dream. You do it now. You go for it. And that, that, I'll never forget that moment. And quite honestly, he wasn't a conversationalist. So I think that was one of maybe six conversations I had with him my whole life. And, and, but what know, a I conversation, that, you know, though, Jim. What a conversation. What a conversation. What a conversation. And that, that altered, you know, a big start of my life. And, and then I knew, you know, my parents were older, so I felt horrible leaving them. It was almost like leaving children, even though I knew they were okay. Um, they were hitting seventies by the time I was getting out of the house uh, down in Florida, and it was. Um, I I always brought him on the road with me since the early nineties. I always had them part of my life, both my mom and dad. And when I got sent it live, I'd fly him up, and he was so funny when I'd introduce him to people. He just. All he cared about was, does this guy drink beer and hang out, or does he, is he part of the Elks Club? <laughs> I mean, it went from stain you, to 
Sylvester Stallone. You gotta do you gotta do the thing about meeting Sylvester Stallone. You gotta do that. I mean it was just Yes, I mean I, I mean I, I introduced him Stallone. He's telling me this whole thing. He's like, you know, I heard he has a place in Florida. You think he you think he's in the Elks? Or what? <laughs> I said I I doubt it. Because well, yeah, he should look into it. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> so, and then And he wasn't trying so to be funny, he, was he? No, not at all. He's dead serious. So then I then I <laughs> introduce him to Sylvester Stallone. And Stallone was such a great man. I, I really, I really admired that man. And um, he told amazing stories. I said, do you mind meeting my dad? My dad is dying to meet you. Because, yeah, I love to meet your father. So <laughs> I said, uh, you know, he's a World War II vet. He was like, oh, my God, he's a man. <laughs> so I, <laughs> so I, I go, Dad, Stallone and Mr. Stallone's my dad, and he goes, yeah, call, me, call me Sylvester. He goes, listen, I'm a World War II. I mean, it's amazing. And my father goes, you got a place in Florida? Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I live in Florida. He goes, yeah, yeah, it's Hollywood. But, you know, not Hollywood like Hollywood. It's a Hollywood, Florida. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> you got an elk where you're at? You have an elks club? And he looked at him. And he looked at me like he didn't know if he was kidding, but he could tell by my face he wasn't kidding. <laughs> and he goes, El- Elks? He goes, yeah, it's like spaghetti night on Tuesday night, all you can drink. And I, you know, I, I make spaghetti at these things. I, I don't know about no Elks club. <laughs> come to Planet Hollywood. And my father goes, doesn't even miss a beat. Planet Hollywood, $15 a beater. And he makes a gesture that he's, Playing with his donkey, and he goes, "Yeah, I'll bring you to Elks Club. You'll be out of business in five years." <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know what? That uh, that that's, that's got to be so hilarious. deeply meaningful to you to have those kinds of things. That, you know, to have that interaction with him, and 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 I love the fact that you're not working out your angst on stage. You celebrate this man for who he was, and that is so endearing. Oh yeah, I I learned so much from him. It's like um. Even that moment, even meeting Sting, you know, it, 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 he goes to meet Sting, and my dad goes, what's your name? He goes, Sting. Sting? Sting. Sting? Your mother named you Sting? <laughs> he, goes, he goes, no, that's my stage. And he just, he put his hand in the air, and he said, I, I don't know. <laughs> isn't it, isn't it great to have that yes what it taught me was it, at the end of the day it doesn't matter if you're the CEO you're the biggest star you're the biggest whatever if, here's a man whose credentials blow yours away or match yours on a different level and it's you know and whatever faith you're into I learned so much about you know they talk about whatever Lord or God you follow would sacrifice, this man sacrificed. He sacrificed his whole life. And there's a lot of us that have family members that sacrificed their life. There's no books written about them. There's no, you know, altar made for them. But who's to say what sacrifice is bigger than the other? I mean, the man had no mother, 10 kids, abused as a kid, watched, was in world war, Watching people get maimed, forced to have to kill people. I mean, so at the end of the day, that, that it just taught me so much about it doesn't matter you're the CEO, or you're the president, or you're the biggest star, or you're the biggest. You don't, have, you don't know what you have over the person that's living right next to you. And, and that person could have been a greater success, a greater person than you. They're just not glorified for it. That, 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 that's beautiful. That is beautiful. And, and as, he, as his health started to decline and you stepped into a role of caregiver, what were some of the things going yeah. on in your heart during that time? Well, the hardest thing, um, the hardest thing, honestly, was not watching him struggle, you know, soiling himself, dropping a deuce, which I would – I would make comedy about, 
I mean, I can. I said my next book is going to be the top ten cities my father crapped himself <laughs> and, and in public, <laughs> and it was. I'm not even kidding you. I no, that's perfect. <laughs> At least ten cities where I'm, I'm, ugh, I'm gagging in the bathroom of a five star hotel and in the in the in the American Airlines club that I forced my way. But the worst for me was to see him defeated. So I I, saw, I knew he was defeated on many levels. You know, when an elderly lose their car. They get defeated emotionally, and they it's it's almost like they know uh oh this is this is it, you take a big chunk out of their life well, this is really happening this is really happening um you know he said things to me like uh I think my days are numbered, and that was before his dementia really kicked in. I said, what do you mean by that? I think my days are numbered and i I went out of my way if I had a tour, I didn't care how much it cost. I'm bringing it with him. I lost money by hiring a tour bus, and I didn't care. I just, to me, it, it meant more to be there. I don't want him alone to go through this. And I beg God, please, God, make sure I'm there. And I was, so it was great. But I remember one time he dropped a, you know, he's, he's in the plane, we're taxiing, we just landed, and the whole time, like, please don't crap yourself. Please don't crap <laughs> Please don't crap this. We're almost there. It's only an hour and a half flight. And we land, we're taxing, and he looks at me and he goes, I got to go. I went, oh, God, Dad, please. Just can you hold it? And he went, okay, yeah, no, I held it. And then it's like when you smell that diaper, in the, and, and I'm looking, I knew it was him, but I'm looking, there was a baby a couple rows behind me. Flame it on like, the baby. You're going to have yeah, you're gonna have to change that kid. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know looking at yeah, four A because it's back there in thirteen B. <laughs> well, see, this is why yeah. this is why I wanted you on the show so much, Jim, because you bring such a heart to this, and you can tell that your your great love for your father and this thing. And so many people get resentful. They're they're doing what you did, but they're doing it with clenched fist, and you're doing it with a grieving heart. Wow. You got tears coming down your face, but you're laughing at the same time because you love this man so much and you respect him. And and I can't tell you how grateful I am that you've shared a little bit of your heart. Uh, we, we're about out of time, but I want to make sure I talk about a little bit of things that you are doing right now. You're a big, big-time big baseball fan. Big-time baseball yeah, fan. People, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I started um, I started this Mets recap where after every Mets game, I would put a recap. And it really turned into something cool and all that jazz. And I didn't know they'd make it to the World Series that year, which is why every game became even bigger viewership. And I did it last year, even though only the diehard fans know. But what I liked was I started this whole community of baseball fans, uh, a Washington fan, a Braves fan, who I just went to a game to it, um, out west, Seattle. I have all these different fans, and I said, you know what? It'd be really cool if everyone else started making recaps, and by the end of the year, we can start our own little ESPN for fans run by the fans. Like, I, I just sat with, I went to Atlanta, sat with one of the fans, and a recap guy does Atlanta, and I was more fascinated to listen to him talk about the Braves and each player than any ESPN would analyze. They're like, wow, it's such a great fan point of view. And I went, there has to be. So I created Bats, Balls, and Brew, B-R-E-U. And people go on that site. And, and in the next month, I'm going to be looking at certain recaps, picking people calling them up and, and creating some you know, online network, which now there's uh, two different uh, networks that like, hey, we really want to get involved with this. This is a, this is a great idea. And I went, it is a, it's an awesome, it's awesome to be a Mets fan sitting there talking to a Nationals fan who I can't stand. And, <laughs> well, to be and, fair. And, yeah. And a, <laughs> yeah, and a and a Phillies fan, and I'm at a game with a Braves fan, and we're just talking baseball, and it's 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 a pretty awesome community. So I hope more people get involved. You can put your videos up at Bats, Balls, and Brew. And I'm going to put that on our, our website here, Bats, Balls, and Brew, and that's B-R-E-U dot com. John, you say, had, that, John had... 
That was dot com. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm just checking. Bats, balls, and brew dot com, and we'll have that out there. And uh, Jim, I, I we only got just a couple seconds left. You bring such a heart Anytime. to this thing, and people need to hear this. People, it's okay to celebrate even the crappy things, literally the crappy things going on. It's okay because we're celebrating the life of someone we love. Yes, it's painful. Yes, it's hard. Yes, our heart breaks through all these things. But but we also are celebrating this thing, and you've done that. Just one last thing to somebody who's taking care of their dad right now. Yeah. What what what's your heart to them? Here here's the thing: you can't get angry, you can't take it personal. It is your parent, but what you don't understand the circle of life, which they don't teach you in school. The circle of life is your child, you're nurtured. Then you go on your journey, you create your family. However. Your parents are not those strong bulls. They now deteriorate. They become children. And your next cycle, if you're strong enough to do it, is take care of them. You can't get angry at them because they don't have the strength or they don't have the emotional drive knowing they're going to be deceased soon. You have to step out of that personal realm and realize where they're at in life and step up to help them. Mm. Last, Last little thing. For you as a caregiver, what was something yeah. that you specifically did just to protect your own heart in this thing? Uh, to be quite honest with you, telling people the stories because and, – and kept my close friends. And if you don't have friends that can make you laugh, then you're doomed. You're, you're, you're doomed. You cannot – heartache is a part of life, but the greatest healing – is laughter. I don't care what anyone says. For for someone to sit there and laugh about, you know, pooping yourself and blah, blah, I mean, that that is harsh to deal with. But when you have people busting each other's chops and it, it, you need that laughter, you need that person that's cold or funny and knows how to get it, you need it. It's, it's the best to be in the world to get you through it all. That's the perfect note to end this on. Jim Brewer, everyone, uh, we've known him for years out on stage and comedy, but now you see his heart. Now you see why I wanted him on this show. Uh, this show is all about that, bringing a little bit of laughter, a little lightheartedness, and and wrapping our arms around you all as caregivers as best as we can because I need you to do that for me as well. We're all in this together. We're going to get strong together. We're going to laugh together. We're going to grieve together, but we're going to do it in a healthy place. And Jim Brewer showed us how to do that a little bit better today. My question is to anybody that comes into my circle how is this going to help me take care of my wife with severe disabilities? And if it if it doesn't strengthen me and if it doesn't equip me to better do that, then get out of the way. I'm going to find somebody that can. And you helped me to do that today just by lightening my heart. And and I'm I'm yeah. extremely grateful, Jim. And and I'll have this up on the website. We'll have it for this is a Father's Day show. Please know you have my I'll gratitude. Put a link up. Oh, oh my God, absolutely. Anything you need, please, please reach out. Don't hesitate. I love I live for this. I live for it. Hey. I, to me, my passion and heart is there. I'll do a whole tour for you if we have to. So whatever you need. <laughs> oh, well, John, with it. John, you shaped John's adult life, which I think you probably ought to face some type of charges I for that. I'm really serious. But... I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. In this. However, I am really glad because uh, I'm, I'm glad you're a Mets fan. This is, uh, you know, I, I love baseball myself, and really, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad you're a Mets fan. Said very few people ever. I know, right? Well, I'm, I'm a fan. Um, I'm a fan of whoever's. Being the pants off of Boston. That's who I'm a fan of. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you're a busy guy and you got to go, and, and I'm going to run and go be a caregiver myself here. Later. Thank, Thank you, man. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Jim. Later. Bye. Hey, this is Larry the Cable Guy, and you are listening to Hope for the Caregivers with Peter Rosenberg. And if you're not listening to it, you're a communist. Get her done.